Hello friends and welcome again to another edition of Vespa's Fire. We are glad you're able to join us. Before we dive into today's uh, lesson, why don't you uh, bow your heads with us so that we can pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity again that we can come and learn from you. May your Holy Spirit be our teacher and guide for this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, friends, I want to do a sequel to our two-part series on the interpreters of God's love in which if you did not have a chance to watch those two, I'll encourage you to take some time and watch them. But today we are continuing in an important line of thought in which I have entitled today's presentation, The Fish Joint. Now, some of you might be thinking, what exactly is the fish joint? You might think, am I talking about joints in the body of the fish? Or am I talking about a place where people go to eat fish? But all in all, we're going to discover shortly what I mean by this presentation that I have entitled The Fish Joint. Let's first of all take some time and define the, terminolo the terminologies here, the use of the word joint. What do I mean by calling it a joint? One, here it is. Uh, a joint is defined as a place or part at which two or more things are joined. But also uh, in anatomy, a joint, it's a point of articulation between two or more bones, especially such a connection that allows motion, you know, like uh, the elbow, that will be a joint probably, and you know, the knee, that will be a joint probably. So those are joints in the human body. But that's not where I'm going. The joint definition that I want us to work with is actually a definition in the slang, which is this. It is a cheap or disreputable gathering place. A place where people get together, a place where people gather, but it is not the most respected place. It is not the most desirable place where people will really want to be. Now, let me summarize for you the story which we are going to be dealing with. It's mainly the story of Jonah that is found in the book of Jonah from chapter 1 to chapter 4. Here's a summary of it. God wants to send his prophet. His prophet says no and runs away. God follows the prophet, allows the prophet to be swallowed by a, a, a fish. Then three days later, he is vomited in a show close to the city that God wants to send him. The prophet goes into the city. He preaches there. The people repent. The prophet is mad. End of story. Think about it. Interesting. It begins with God's prophet saying no. It ends with God's people repenting and the prophet being mad. That is such an anticlimax, but it is an important story nonetheless that God wants us to learn from. So, hey, what are the things that I don't want us to focus on in this story per se? They are important. How does Jonah run away? That is important. How the people of Nineveh repent? That is critical. How does Jonah get upset? All those factors are recorded in the story. However, I want us to focus on something else more precious, which is this. What happens when God finally catches up with his runaway prophet? And the place where God catches up with him is where I call the fish, fish joint. A disreputable place where nobody will want to be. But it is here where God catches up with Jonah and it seems they have a meeting of the minds. Jonah does not have a place to run away to. He cannot run anymore. He is trapped in here and he cannot move. And God knows it. And this is a place that God brings Jonah. So let us look at how does God come through in the book of Jonah. One, I want us to consider in the book of Jonah, God has an idea. Also, in the book of Jonah, God has a problem. In the same book, God has options. But also God has a decision to make. And then last but not least, God has a solution. And because friends, I want you to know that what we are seeing here, God's idea, God's problem, God's options, God's decisions, God's solutions, the very same way that those things are true in the story of Jonah, those same things apply even in your life, 
and in my life to this very day. So let's take them one after the other and see exactly how this plays out in the book of Jonah. One, we are going to begin by looking at God's idea. What is God's idea? It is found in the book of Jonah chapter 1 and verse 1 through 2. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. That's God's idea. What is it? God decides to send his prophet from Israel to go to Nineveh and to preach. So God has his prophet in Israel, and he has a people in Nineveh who God cares about, and God wants to get his prophet from Israel all the way to Nineveh and say, go tell my people, go preach to them, because the sins of that city have come up against me. Why is God saying this? Because God loves the people in Nineveh. Regardless of how evil they have been, God is interested in them. Regardless of how wayward they have gone, God is interested in them. God is interested in these people and he is sending his prophet to go all the way to Nineveh and proclaim his word. I want to suggest to you, my dear friend, that God has a similar idea today. God's idea is he wants to send you and me to the different places, the different cities in the United States, to the different cities in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, in Australia, even in Antarctica. God wants to send his people in all the different places of the world. God knows where the people who are in need of him are. He knows the people who are getting lost. He knows the people who don't have hope. He knows the people who are in despair. He knows the people who are struggling. He knows the people who have missed their way. He knows the people who are staring at a crushless grave. And God is intentional about sending missionaries, about sending his people close and far, wherever they are. God wants to send his people to them. God has a similar idea. He wants to send people in those respective places. But you see, God has a problem. And God's problem is seen in the book of Jonah chapter 1 and verse 3. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Interesting. I want you to realize God's problem. The chosen servant is reluctant to go and chooses another destination. As a matter of fact, this reluctant prophet is willing to pay money so that he can run away from God. Terrible. Think about it. The prophet of God, the one who hears God's voice, the one who knows God's heart, the one who understands God's intention, is willing to pay money to run away from the mission field as far as he could get. I want to suggest to you, my dear friends, that God has a similar problem today. God has a similar problem because God faces the problem whereby the people that he wants to use, that is you and me, many other times we are willing to invest in doing anything else that is going to keep us busy, keep us engaged, other than going to do that which God wants us to do. It is tempting for us to run away from godly assignments. It is tempting for us to run away from the places that God is calling us to go. It is tempting for us to be able to invest our resources in things that are not mission focused in where God wants us to be. God has a similar problem today. But here is the thing. He is the God of the universe. And the God of the universe does not run out of options. And so God has some options. I want just to suggest some of them to you. God could have chosen to send an obedient angel instead of a reluctant prophet. As a matter of fact, he had done it before by sending angels to Sodom and Gomorrah. Or, you know, the Bible tells us that the city of Nineveh had so many cattle. God could have chosen to use the cattle in Nineveh to preach to the people. 
After all, he had used a donkey before to speak to a stubborn prophet. Can you imagine the kettle just walking around, preaching the gospel, telling people you need to repent? Now, that will get their attention. But somehow God did not choose to use that option. Or God could have said, I have so many other people. Why don't I go ahead and choose someone else and just send them over there? Well, God could have definitely done that. He does not have a shortfall of people. Even today, over 7 billion people on this planet, he could pick somebody, at least one person will say yes. Or maybe God will say, why don't I wait just a couple of more years? Because a few other prophets are coming down the line that I know one of them, like Isaiah, will be willing to say, here I am, Lord, send me. Or Hosea or Amos. I'm going to pick one of those prophets and just wait a little bit. I'll let Nineveh continue going on with their lifestyle. I'll let them perish for now, but I'm going to wait until another prophet comes and I'm going to send them. God has options even today. God could choose to pick somebody else. But as we see in the story of Jonah, God had a decision to make. And for sure, God made a decision. And here's the decision that God made. Jonah chapter 1 and verse 4. The Lord sent a great wind on the sea. And such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to wreck. This is what God chooses to do. He pursues the prophet. And then in verse 6, when Jonah does not seem to listen to the wind, God seems to impress the captain to go down to where Jonah is sleeping and the captain says to him, get up, call on your God. The very same God that Jonah is running away from is the same God that the captain is telling Jonah, get up and call on your God. It's as though God is deciding, I'm going to pursue this prophet and let him know that I still need him on this assignment. And then when God sends the winds and it seems not to uh, stir Jonah at first, then God sends the captain. You know what God allows to happen? It says in verse 7, Then the sailors say to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. You know why? Because there are times that God will permit every event and orchestrate events in such a way that they point back to you and me to let us know God is still intending for us to be where he wants us to be. You may run away, but you can never hide from him. And he will allow every single wave and storm as it's blowing to still safeguard your life. But in the midst of everything, he still wants you on this assignment. You see, God's decision is God decides to stick with Jonah, the reluctant prophet. And when God makes that call, I want to suggest to you that God makes the same call even in your life and in my life today. He will have easily given up on us when we will have chosen not to spend time with him. When we will have chosen not to follow through with the commitment that he is calling us to make. When he has clearly provided for us the resources and instead of investing the resources in doing his work, we we'll invest the resources to run away from him and from his mission as far away as we can. God could have done that. He could have said, forget about these guys. But what God chooses to do. He is persistent. He continues with the assignments and wants to be sure that you and I know he is still interested in us to be involved in those assignments. You know, I just have a few thoughts here for your reflection, my friend. And that is, there is an assignment with your name on it. You can run away from it. You can reject it. You can pay to go as far as you want to go. But I want to suggest to you today, there is an assignment with your name on it and God is interested in you being able to fulfill that assignment. God not only wanted to save the people of Nineveh, 
God also wanted to save Jonah. And that is the thing that many of us don't understand, which is our involvement in ministry is not just one way that God is trying to save those other people and forget about you. What we don't sometimes understand is that when God chooses to involve us in ministry, he uses his mission to help us to overcome things in our lives that become a hindrance in our walk with him. For example, God involves us in ministry to help us confront some of the struggles in our lives. Fear. God could send us in places where we think, how can I be able to do that? How can I be able to succeed in this place? These challenges are too high. How could I ever be successful? And God uses mission and ministry to help us overcome those fears when we trust him. God also uses ministry to help us overcome prejudice. There are times when we may have prejudice of, over one group. And God, the same way he used Jonah and sent him to a people that Jonah never wanted to go to, God uses ministry to help us touch the untouchables. Reach to people who may, we may never think we needed to have reached. God has a way to use ministry to break barriers. God also uses ministry to destroy our pride. Because sometimes we can become boastful. And think we can do it in our power. God calls us to God-sized ministry responsibilities. Where we recognize if God does not help us, there is no way we are going to do it. And so God chooses to invest in us and send us there so that our pride can be broken. And we realize only Him could bring us through. So in place of fear, in place of prejudice, in place of pride, God builds us in ministry to give us faith to give us love, to give us humility. God makes a decision. And I want to suggest to you today that God has made a decision to pursue you to the edges of where you're going to run to because God is interested in you, God is interested in me, and he not only wants to save other people, he also wants to save you. And so in this case, the question then is, what is God's solution? God's solution is found in Jonah chapter 1 and verse 17. He says, But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. Now that, it's God's solution. I want you to notice that it says God provided a great fish. And that great fish swallowed Jonah you know I know some people have read that story and said well I'm not so sure how that can happen let me tell you friends w coming to scripture you see the main question is not whether Jonah swallowed the whale or the, sw the whale swallowed Jonah is that God was trying to fulfill something in this story and in this particular story here's what I want us to recognize that in God's solution the great idea is not that a fish swallows John. The great idea is that the God of the whole universe provided a fish as a venue to meet with Jonah, the fish joint. God makes available room inside the fish that in that place he will let his prophet far away from the destructions of the world far away from the destructions of anything else, far away from any other influences, Jonah is going to be there for three days and three nights just to reflect God's calling in his life. And it is in this place that Jonah is alone with God that Jonah comes to the reality of God is interested in me. And when you read the prayer of Jonah in Jonah chapter 2, you realize it is in that place, out of the depths of the grave, out of the depths of the waters, that Jonah realizes, I can only turn to God, the one that I have been running away from all this time. And friends, I know some of you today are actually in that place. And God is speaking to you through this message. The question that you have to deal with is this. 
Are you in that place where you are alone with God? Are you in that place where all other distractions have been taken away? All other hopes that you are going to cling on have been stripped of you. And it is only you. And you recognize it is only God who can deliver you from that place. Because if we don't get to that position, if we don't get to that place where it is only God and us, we are always distracted with everything else. We never get to truly hear the voice of God speaking to us, telling us, I am interested not only in saving the Ninevites, I'm not interested only in saving the Israelites. I'm not just interested in saving those who you think are rebellious. I am also interested in saving you because you are also important to me. And that is why today I want to ask of you to listen to God's voice as God speaks to you because he is allowing you to be in the fish joint for a purpose that you may talk with him you may commune with him you may engage with him and be fully prepared to be used by God in such a great mission place because it was after being in the fish joint that Jonah went ahead to proclaim God's mercies and the people in Nineveh repented and their lives were spared Friends, I want to invite you today to have this dialogue with God. If you find your place in a place where you're stripped of everything else, other distractions, other influences, that God may just speak to you. And some of you, I will appeal, you don't have to wait to be stripped of everything before you may actually hear God's voice speaking to you. So why don't we bow our heads right now and talk with God and allow Him to commune with us in these places so that we can become faithful and effective interpreters of his love, faithful and effective ministers of him, whatever we are. Let us pray. Father, many a times it seems necessary for you to strip us of everything that causes destruction and causes us to lose sight of you. And when you bring us to that place, that is the time when we become in tune with you. And I pray for my listener today as I pray for myself that, Lord, bring us to that place where we are willing to actually let go of all the distractions and just be able to connect with you in that unique place and the lord you may make us to be more effective in the ministry that you're calling on us there are people who still don't know about you and you want us to be involved in this work so help us not to be distracted but help us to stay focused and whatever distractions are coming our way, please, Lord, take them away that we may spend time with you and have others be one to your kingdom. This is our prayer in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you, and we'll have a chance to see you again on the next Vespers Fire production.